Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Give Him some more praise tonight. God, we worship You, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You can be seated in Jesus' name. Well, my, my, my. Feels like we've had church around here for a little while. <clears throat> but uh, hopefully we're not through yet. If we are, we better just go ahead and shut her down, dismiss right now. But <clears throat> it is my pleasure to be back once again to score in this local assembly and be with the host pastor, Brother and Sister Bass. We love and appreciate them so very much. They have blessed our local congregation as well as our conferences in Kansas throughout the years, and we count them as very close and dear friends. And I covet and appreciate their friendship so very much. Appreciate the hospitality of this local assembly. Uh, that wonderful meal that was prepared last night after service, and uh, what a what a beautiful room, nice. Uh, uh, condiments in the room, and we appreciate so much all that has been done to facilitate this meeting. Uh, thank you, Brother Burgess, for that message last night. My, my, I am looking beyond Ichabod. In Jesus' name. Well, hallelujah. Amen. And uh, Brother Smith challenged me today with that word from the Lord. Praise God. Made me want to go get on a plane, get back to Wichita and teach. I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching a Bible study right now in Wichita, Brother Smith, and my son's teaching it for me tonight. I told the church Sunday night, I said, and uh, the diff different ones from the Bible study has been coming to church now for a few weeks. We baptized the first lady out of the Bible study Sunday night before last, but this last Sunday night, they were there. I told them, I said, now Jonathan's going to be preaching Wednesday night. And uh, I looked at Nancy, who's really the key person to the Bible study. And I said, Nancy and Jonathan's going to be teaching the Bible study Thursday night. I said, but as soon as I get back, I'm teaching the Bible study. He's not teaching my Bible study while I'm here. <laughs> Amen. But uh, 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 there's nothing like preaching souls, nothing that will bring the fire of the Holy Ghost into assembly, like people re being baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, praise God. <clears throat> and uh, I, uh, I really feel less than worthy to stand behind this pulpit to preach to this congregation and all of the great men of God that are sitting here in this congregation before me tonight, as well as those that are with me on this platform. But it has fallen my lot, and I will do my best to obey the Holy Ghost. That's the only promise I can make you tonight, is just to try to follow the Holy Ghost and do what I feel led to do in the Spirit tonight. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. I am so looking forward to the ministry of Brother Pixler and Brother White tomorrow. I've heard these men many times. They have always enriched my life with their ministry. Hebrews chapter number 6, and we're going to begin with the first verse, and we will read down through verse number 6, the first six verses. <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, 
of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. I would like to take our text tonight from the first verse and four small words in the middle of that first verse of Scripture that we read from chapter 6. And those four words are simply, Let us go home. Would you say that with me tonight? Let us go home. Uh, I hope that we can go on tonight. Praise God. Would you pray with me? Let's ask the Lord for His help right now. In the name of Jesus. God, we're asking you. Amen. You can be seated in Jesus' name. Every building needs a foundation. And the church is certainly founded on a solid rock. The Bible tells us that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. The foundation of the church is steadfast and sure. The foundation of the church is unmovable. The church of the living God is on a sure foundation. And when the Apostle Paul penned these words in Hebrews chapter number 6, and he said, Therefore, leave in the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. He was not telling the church to forsake the foundation. He was not telling us that we ought to just leave the foundation behind us and never mention it again. The foundation is something that will be preached again and again and again and again and again. For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is already laid. The foundation's already down. The foundation's already settled. The Word of God's not going to change. It doesn't matter how much the world changes. The Word is not going to change. It doesn't matter how much society changes. The Word of God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He said, my Word is forever settled in heaven. Men are going to change. And a lot of times even churches are going to change. But the Word of God is not going to change. The Word of God is forever. Forever settled. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of the Lord abideth forever. Thank God for a sure foundation. I wouldn't want to be building something on a foundation that was shaky. I wouldn't want to be building a night on a foundation that wasn't solid, that wasn't sure. But thank God that we've got a sure foundation tonight. Thank God for the foundational message that there is but one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's not going to change. 
the foundation of the oneness message is not going to change. That is the message that is going to be preached until the trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place and the church is taken out of here. When Jesus comes, there's going to be a man of God in a pulpit crying to the top of his lungs, there is but one God and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank God for that revelation. Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Ah, any church that's not built upon the revelation of God in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, is a church that's not going to stand. It's a church that's coming down. It's a church that's going to fall. Any church that is not built upon the foundation that the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus is a church that's not going to stand. Not going to stand the test of time and eternity. That church is coming down. The church that's built upon the revelation of Jesus Christ as the mighty God, as the everlasting Father, as the Prince of Peace, as the Wonderful and the Counselor. That's the church that's going to stand in the storm, going to stand the test. Thank God for the foundation. Amen. Thank God for the foundation of this holiness message. Well, hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad tonight that there are still some places where that you can say the word holiness and you don't feel everything tighten up on you. I'm glad there are still some places where that you can even preach holiness and it don't tighten up on you. I'm glad there are still some places where that you can name the standards of holiness and it don't tighten up on you. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Because the church is built on that foundation. The real church is built on that foundation. It's built on a holiness foundation. The real church isn't built on a foundation of compromise. That kind of church ain't going to stand. You hear me? That church is coming down. Because when the church loses the foundation of holiness, there's already a crack in the foundation of the revelation of Jesus' name baptism. And there's already a crack in the foundation of the revelation of God in Christ. And there's already a, a crack in the foundation of the essentiality of speaking in other tongues in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I still believe you have to talk in tongues to get the Holy Ghost. I'm going to go a little further with that and tell you I still believe you have to talk in tongues to keep the Holy Ghost. Well, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Why don't we just have church a little while tonight? Amen. Oh, some of you, some of you just a little bit too tight. You need to relax a little bit. Praise God. Amen. There's nothing like the, a, a, a one God, Jesus' name, apostolic, tongue-talking church. And there's nothing like the Word of God and receiving it with joy. Oh, hallelujah. I still, it seems like I remember reading in my Bible that you ought to receive with meekness the engrafted Word that is able to save your soul. Ah, uh, thank God. Hallelujah. Preaching is what builds the church. Preaching is what lays the foundation in the church. Mm, amen. I'm going to go back there in a little bit. But in the book of Ezra, the Bible says that when they saw that the foundation of the temple was laid, that they rejoiced with great joy. And there was shouting in the temple. There was shouting because they saw the foundation of the temple being laid. You know what that tells me? That tells me that when the preacher's preaching on the foundation, that the church ought to be shouting. Hallelujah. When the man of God's working on the foundation, the church ought to be on her feet saying, that's right, pastor. Come on, preach it. I don't ever get tired of hearing one God. I don't ever get tired of hearing Jesus' name, baptism. I don't ever get tired of hearing holiness. I don't ever get tired of hearing about the Holy Ghost talking in tongues. Ah, 
And after a while, the Lord will. And I want to talk to some of you that do get tired of hearing about some of that. Because you don't ever, you don't ever, you don't ever want to get tired of hearing about the foundation. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for the foundation. You ought to appreciate the foundation. You ought to love the foundation. Every time you hear the foundation preach, you ought to... It ought to excite you. It ought to thrill you all over again. Oh. Oh. Hallelujah. God pity the person that would despise the foundation. I said God pity the person that would despise the foundation. God pity the person that would get all sold up when a man of God gets up and preaches. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord. Hallelujah. God pity the individual that would that would that would mm, get mad, get mm, uh, get get that old pouting spirit. Yeah, sold up spirit on them. When the men... Oh, I... Lord, help us tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, when your pastor's teaching a Bible study or preaching on holiness, you ought to... that ought to excite you. That ought to thrill you. That ought to thrill you. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe that's all part of the foundation. I believe that's all part of the foundation. You can't have a church without the foundation. There can't be a strong building without the foundation. Amen. Uh, we're, uh, we're adding on a little bit to the house back home. Uh, adding on a family room on the back of the house. And, and uh, you know, uh, the first thing that we had to do was dig some footings and get the footings dug and then pour some stem walls and and then pour slab. Get the foundation ready so that you could, you know, build some walls on the foundation and put some furniture in, in that room and, and, uh, make it habitable. Uh, you know, I, I really don't think that my wife would have been very pleased by the bass if, if we'd have just got the foundation laid and, and I said, I said, honey, how you like our new family room? <laughs> No walls, no furniture, no roof, nothing on it, just just the foundation, just the slab there. Well, don't you like our new family room? Uh, yeah, babe, I like this new family room, but but we're not through with it yet, are we? We're, we're not finished quite yet, are we? Isn't there something else that's going to go out here besides just these just just this concrete? Are we going to have something else out here besides just this? I, I thought there was more to a family room than this. There is more to a building than a foundation. There is more to a building than just the foundation. And the Apostle Paul was not saying, let's forsake the foundation. But he was saying, hey, we got a good foundation. Now then, let's do something with it. Hey, we've got a good foundation. Now then, let's put something on it. We've got a good foundation. Now then, let's let's put some walls up here. Let's put a roof over our heads. Let's put let's put some furniture in here. Uh, let's make this thing what it ought to be, what God intended for it to be. God intended for the church to have a strong foundation, but that's not all that God intended for there to be in the church or in the life of a saint of God. I think that we can, I think that we can find precedent in scripture. As a matter of fact, I think that the scripture speaks very clearly to us concerning God's desire for His people to go beyond just, just repentance and just beyond just believing on Him and beyond just being baptized in His name and beyond just receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gives the utterance. I think that there is precedent in the Word of God that God intends for the church to go beyond just having a good standard of holiness. I think that God lets us see in the Word of the Lord that He's got some things for us that that takes us beyond that, that takes us to a Higher place, if you please. Well, praise God. Amen. Uh, we know that, and it's, it's very simple uh, typology for us to understand that the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, 
It's a type of repentance and them going through the Red Sea and being baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The type of water and spirit baptism and then coming to Sinai and that's the giving of the law 50 days after the Passover. Amen. And so Sinai really answers to Pentecost. Because that's where the law was given at Sinai. And that's where the law is given even now in the churches at Sinai. He said, I'm going to take my word and I'm not going to write it on tables of stone anymore. But I'm going to take my word and I'm going to write it upon the fleshly tables of your heart. And that's what happens when the Holy Ghost comes in. The Spirit of God begins to write the word, the law of God upon the fleshly tables of our hearts. And when the Holy Ghost comes and God begins to write His Word in our hearts, then then there is a deep appreciation and love within the heart of the child of God that has been born of God for the Word of God that He has got within the heart of that individual who has been born again of the water and of the Spirit. Amen. But we also can see that when the children of Israel had been at Sinai for a while, that finally the day arrived that God said, You have dwelt long enough at this mount. You've been in this place long enough. You've circled this mountain as long as I want you to circle this mountain. It's time to straighten this thing out. It's time to go some places where I want to take you. You're not where I want you to be yet. You're not, you haven't seen everything I want you to see yet. You don't have everything that I want you to have yet. Come on, let's go on. Let's go on to enter into that land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm sorry, I cannot see that the, that the promised land in Scripture is the type of the Holy Ghost. The, the, the type of the Holy Ghost is before they get to the promised land. Amen. Oh, oh yeah. And yet, and yet... Here in the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul talks to the children of Israel about not entering into his rest. And yet we know that the rest of God is the Holy Ghost. The rest of God that we have for us today, that He has for us today, is the Holy Ghost. It's speaking in other tongues. As the Spirit gives the utterance. Oh, yes, it is. For with stammering lips and another tongue, will I speak unto this people to whom He said, This is the rest and this is the refreshing. And yet, for all of this, they would not hear. And so just as surely as there were those that, that refused to hear in the wilderness and refused to enter into all that God had for them in that day, just as surely as it happened then, there are those even yet today whom that God speaks to. And he says, I have a rest yet for you. The Apostle Paul is not writing to sinners in Hebrews. He's writing to the church. And he's writing to them concerning what happened to the children of Israel. And he said, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works for forty years. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, that for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom he sware that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. But the Apostle Paul then brings that over to the New Testament church when he says, beginning with chapter 4 and verse number 1, Let us, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. Him, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Oh God, is it possible that there are some of us who are falling short, are coming short, are stopping short of what God wants to do for the church of the living?
living God. Oh, may we, as the Apostle Paul admonished this church that he was writing to in Hebrews chapter 4, let us therefore fear. Is there nothing inside of you? Is there no is there no fear of God in your heart? Is there nothing within you that says, God, Lord, God, how can I how can I stop here when you're when you when when the when the cloud is moving on, when the pillar of fire is moving on, how can I stay here? God, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want you to go on and leave me here. Amen. Oh, dear God. Y'all going to stay with me for a little while tonight. Is it possible that we could just be sitting around talking about the foundation when God's saying, hey, I want a wall on this foundation. When God's saying, hey, it's time to put, it's time to put the, uh, the, the rafters on. And it's time to put the decking on. It's time to, it's time to put the fountain and the shingles on. It's time to, it's time to put the furniture in this place. It's time to, for you to possess what God has promised unto you. Let us therefore fear. I appreciate Brother Max Bass just following the Holy Ghost tonight leading this service. It would have been easy for us just to coast on through the worship service and get through it without seeing what God had for us or without receiving what God had for us. Amen. And we do need to press. We do need to press. We don't need to just come nonchalantly. What kind of an attitude do we come to the house of God with? You don't need to come to church with a nonchalant, lackadaisical, who cares attitude. You ought to come with your nostrils flaring. You ought to come with your heart palpating. You ought to come with, with something inside of you saying, dear God, what is it that you want to do in this service tonight? Who is it, Lord, that you want to touch tonight? What soul do you want to feel with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Who is it, God, that you want to heal? What miracle do you want to perform in this house tonight? Let us therefore fear. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And then the Apostle Paul said, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest he said, let us fear lest we not get there. Let, let us fear lest we not enter in. And then he said, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. And that word labor simply means let's be diligent. Let's be diligent to enter into that rest, that place, that position, whatever it is that God has in store for the church on that particular day or even that week or month or year, whatever it is that God has in store. Let us labor, let us be diligent that we might enter into what God has for the church. Hallelujah. Let's be diligent. Let's be diligent. The book of Proverbs says, The soul of the sluggard desireth, but hath nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. I doubt if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't desire to see a move of God. I doubt if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't desire to have good church. Doesn't desire to see somebody filled with the Holy Ghost. That doesn't desire to see a healing, a miracle take place. But the soul of the sluggard desires, but he never gets what he's after. He desires it, but he never has enough discipline to go for it. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Oh, God. Hallelujah. The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. 
the soul of that saint of God that says, my pastor's not going to have to push this thing through by himself tonight. My pastor's not going to have to carry the load of this service alone tonight. He's not going to have to carry the worship by himself. He's not going to have to preach by himself tonight. Oh, oh God. Oh, where is the where is the church? Where is the saint of God that will say, Oh Lord, we 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 refuse to stay out. We refuse to be left behind. We refuse. Let us labor. And then the apostle Paul said, Let us hold fast our profession. And that means to say the same thing. Hold fast to our profession. To say the same thing. Say, say the same thing as who? Say the same thing as what? It means to say the same thing as the pastor saying. You're never going to enter in as long as you're contradicting the pulpit. You're never going to enter in as long as you're arguing with the pulpit. You're never going to enter in as long as you're disagreeing with the pulpit. The only way that the church is going to get in is for the church to say the same thing that the man of God is saying. Oh, hallelujah. You know how you say the same thing? That's right. When the man of God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, you jump to your feet and shout, Amen! When the pastor says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen! When the pastor says it's time to have revival, the church ought not start grumbling, murmuring, complaining. Oh, no. You mean we're going to have more than one midweek service this week? You mean we're going to have another prayer chain? You mean there's going to be a fasting chain as well as a prayer chain? Dear God, pastor, what are you trying to do? Tell us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the church ought to be saying, that's right, Pastor. Oh, come on, let's have revival. When the pastor says, you ought to teach a Bible study, you ought to be saying, I'm going to teach a Bible study. Not sitting there saying, oh, you, you, you expect me? You expect me to teach a Bible study? You expect me to bring somebody to church? You expect me to pass out church cards and invite somebody to the house of God? You, you think I'm going to do that? Yeah, yeah. You, can, can you believe that the pastor expects you? He expects you. That is if you're Holy Ghost filled. Because the Bible still says you shall receive where after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in, and in Ocala. Well, hallelujah. Praise God. You shall be witnesses unto me. You shall be a witness. Let's go on. Come on, let's go on. Let's go on. Hallelujah, let's go on. Let's go on to praying people through in every service. Let's go on to the baptistry. If, if the waters are, are troubled in every service. Oh. oh, but Brother Dudley, we have arrived. Who said that? Where'd that come from? Who said that? I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. You have arrived. You're already there. You know, if you get that attitude, that's why you're never going to get there. Because as long as you think you're there, you'll never try to get there. As long as you think that you have arrived, you're never going to try to get to where God wants you to be. But we need to understand we ain't there yet. 
I'll be the first to confess the church our pastor's not there yet. Wichita, Calvary Apostolic Church, Brother Worthen's not there yet. But this one thing we're doing, we're forgetting the things that are behind us. And we're pressing towards the prize. We're pressing for the mark of the prize of the high calling. There's a higher calling, Brother Padgett. There's a higher place that God will take us to if we'll be willing to go. I don't believe the church is at the place of commitment that God wants us to be. I don't believe that the church is at the place of consecration that God wants us to be. I don't believe that the church is at the place of evangelism that God wants us to be. I don't believe that the church is at the place of revival that God wants us to be. Oh, no. I believe it's so much higher than what we can even begin to comprehend. I believe that place is so far up there. Our little old finite minds can't even begin to understand what God really wants to do. Uh, oh, oh. My Bible says he's able to do exceeding and abundant above all that we could ask or even think according to the power that worketh within us. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God. I really didn't intend to get on this, but I'm going to. I feel it in the Holy Ghost tonight. According to the power that worketh within us. According to the power that worketh within us. What power is that? What is the power that works within us? According to the... He's able to do exceeding and abundant above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh within us. What is the power that worketh within us? I want to tell you that God is still manifest in the flesh. That when Jesus ascended into heaven, He said, it's expedient for you that I go away because if I go not away, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, cannot come unto you. He said, I am with you, but I shall be in you. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. The only way that the church can be the church is to let God be God in the church. Is to let God be God in the church. To let God be God in the church. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he said, For the manifestation of the Spirit is given unto every man to profit with all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Hallelujah. If you've got the Holy Ghost, God ought to be manifest in you. You ought to be manifesting God in your flesh. We're not... God was manifest in the flesh. It wasn't flesh that was manifest in the flesh. It was God that was manifest in the flesh. Is God still manifest in the flesh? If He's not, this world don't have any hope. The only hope this world has is for God to be manifest in the flesh. What I'm telling you is I believe that everything that Jesus said about Himself and the Father, the church can say about themselves and the Father. When Jesus said, the works that I do, I do not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, He doeth the works. That's exactly what the church ought to be saying. The works that we're doing, we're not doing it of ourselves. But it's because God is in us. God is in us. God is in us. When we get a better revelation of that, I think we're going to see more of the miracles that God wants us to see. I believe the church ought to be doing everything Jesus did. Yes, sir, brother. He said the works that I do. Oh, but brother Dudley, we've heard that before. When are we going to start believing that? The reason that they didn't enter in because was because they did not believe what they heard. All right. 
the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And I wonder sometimes if we haven't heard it so much that it's become old hat to us. Well, we've heard that before, Pastor Bass. Uh, you need to you need to slap that spirit. I said you need to slap that spirit. It's all right to slap a spirit. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But you can slap the Spirit in Jesus' name. Well, come on. Amen. Somebody said, that's mean preaching. Well, then we need some mean preaching. If that's mean preaching, we need some mean preaching. Because we, we, we need to stop being intimidated by the devil. We need to stop being intimidated by unbelief. We need to stop being intimidated by carnality. We need to stop being intimidated by people that want to come and sit on the pastor while he's preaching and teaching. Hallelujah. Oh. The works that I do shall ye do. Is that what he said? And greater works than these. And greater works than these shall ye do. Oh, come on. Let's go on. Let's go on. Let's go on to see what God has for us. Let's go on to possess, possess everything that God has for us. Let us let us hold fast to our profession. You will not let anybody. You will not let anybody contradict your past. You will not let anybody. Oh, dear God of heaven. If they start saying that, you ought to say, I don't want to hear that. Take it, take your garbage somewhere else. I don't want to hear it. I believe what my pastor preaches. I believe what. I believe. If you're going to get in, you've got to mix faith with what you hear. And then Paul said, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Once that you have that godly fear, and you're saying, dear God, I don't want to be left behind, Lord. When the, when the cloud moves, I want to move. Lord, wherever you go, I want to go with you. Lord, don't leave me sitting here at Sinai when you're, when you're crossing over Jordan. Some of you are going to get left at Sinai while the church crosses over Jordan. You need to, you need to, uh, you need to shake your, you need to wake yourself up tonight. Say, what's wrong with what's happening to me? I see something moving in the church and it's not moving in me. But when you have that fear, and when you have become diligent in your effort, when you're laboring to enter in, and when you're holding fast to your profession, then I want to tell you, you can come boldly before the throne of grace, and you can find grace to help in the time of need. When you are, when you're saying, God, Lord, I don't want to be left behind. I want to enter in, God, and I'm going to labor to enter in, Lord, and I'm holding fast to my profession. Then you can come up there boldly. God saying, Come on now, come on. I want you to come boldly. You tell me what you want. You tell me what you're after. I know that you're hungry for it. I can see the desire in your heart. I can see the intensity of your spirit. Now come on boldly to the throne of grace. And you can find grace to help in the time of need. Oh, hey. And then, and then he takes it a little bit further. And he said, now then, let's go on unto perfection. Amen. If you will notice with me in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul writing to the church before that he tells them, let's, let's go on. Let's leave the principles of the doctrine. Let's go on under perfection. He says, I've got some more things I'd like to preach to you. I've got some more things that I'd like to talk to you about. But he said, you have become dull of hearing. Is that what your Bible said? You have become dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, 
You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You mean to tell me that you've been in the church for five years and the grace of God still hadn't taught you that it's wrong to have a television? You mean to tell me that you're in the, you've been in the church for three or four years and the grace of God that bring us salvation, that teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly love, that we ought to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world? you telling me that that grace of God still hasn't taught you that, 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 that a slit in a woman's skirt is, is sensual? How long is it going to take for you to come on and get catch up here with the church? The pastor ought not have to spend all his time working on the foundation. The pastor ought not have to spend every service lining you. You mean you've been in the church ten years and the pastor still has to come and tell you, hey, hey, young lady, that skirt's a little bit too tight. Let's go on. Dear God, Brother Hood, let's go on. My God, let's go on. When are we going to get beyond that? When are... Yeah, we're not going to stop preaching that because there's always going to be a new convert that's hungry that comes in as a, as a newborn babe and say, oh, feed me, Pastor. Right, right, right. Amen. And while you're sitting there, that new, new convert's going to be saying, Woo! oh, isn't this wonderful? Oh, isn't this great? Thank you. Oh. The devil's mad, but that's all right. I wouldn't feel comfortable if he wasn't. He's in a rage. But there's a reason why he's in a rage. He knoweth. He hath. But a short time. When the devil's mad, that, that just makes me want to shout that much more because I know he knows he's got just a little bit of time left. That's all. Your time's, your time's just about over with, devil. And then we're going to have what God wants us to have. Then we're going to enter into that land flowing with milk and honey. And we're going to possess the promise of God. Amen. Let me, uh, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to wind it up here. So I can preach another hour and a half. No, not really. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel. I'm having trouble reading this without my glasses, and I couldn't see if I put them on. They'd fog up and sweat up. And... When the builders... Somebody got a Bible? <laughs> Brother, Brother Max Bass, would you read this for me? In Ezra chapter 3, beginning with verse number 10. Ezra chapter 3. All right. We made reference to this earlier this evening. When the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, they all shouted with a great shout. But we didn't tell the rest of that, did we? What's the next verse say? But many of the priests and the 
priests and Levites, and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, and had seen the first house. They had seen the first house. When the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, before their eyes they, they wept with a loud voice, and there were there was uh, there was some shouting and some crying. The Bible gives us uh, the strong implication that it was the elders that had seen the first house. They were the ones weeping, and the younger generation they were the ones shouting. I wonder. Brother White, if it might not have been that those elders, they saw the foundation laid, but they remembered what the first house looked like. And they realized how far these this generation had to go to get to where that first generation was. They realized what all had to be put on this foundation, what all had to be built in order for... For this house to even even begin to compare to what that house looked like. Turn with me to the book of Haggai, chapter number 2. And let's read in Haggai, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. You see, this is the Rubabel's temple that, that, that we're reading about in the book of Ezra. The foundation is laid. It's not Solomon's temple, but it's Zerubbabel's temple. It's the it's the restoration temple, and and the, and the foundations laid, and and the elders are weeping because they they remembered what the first house looked like, and they knew that there was a whole lot more that needed to be done before this house was ever going to look like that house. All that was there was just the foundation. That's all. Nothing on it. And they said, oh, and you know, there was, there was, I'm sure there were mixed emotions even among those elders because they were thinking, thank God the foundation's laid. But then they were also thinking, oh, dear God, look how far we have to go to get back to the, to the place to where that, that first house was at. But then the word of the Lord comes through the prophet Haggai in chapter number two. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, in the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And who do you see it now? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it? Is it not in your eyes as in, in comparison of it? Has nothing done? I mean, we got the foundation here and it, it don't even look anything like that first house. Is it not in comparison of that first house as nothing? But yet now, <laughs> oh yeah, saith the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, and be strong. All your people, saith the Lord, and work, and work, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word, I made a covenant with you. When I brought you out of Egypt, I haven't left you. My spirit's still with you. We're going to look beyond. We're going to see something beyond Ichabod. Hallelujah. There's something beyond. That, well, you, 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 oh, yeah, that first temple, it's all been destroyed and, and torn down. But we've got another foundation laid here now. And we're not just going to leave that foundation here. According to the word that I made a covenant with you concerning when you come out of Egypt, my spirit is still among you. Don't be afraid. It is a little while. Oh, a little while. Yeah. And the earth. And the sea. The dry land. I'm going to shake all nations. The desire of all nations shall come. I'm going to fill this house with glory. Say it, the Lord of hosts. The silver's mine. The gold is mine. Say it, the Lord. And the glory of this latter house is going to be greater. What's it look like? I just, all I see is a foundation. But you just wait around just a little while. Well, that, just a little while. And there's something going up on this foundation. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater. Dear 
God of heaven. Hallelujah. I believe the Word of God. Hallelujah. I'm not looking for the church to go down. I'm looking for the church to go up. Uh, I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting a great falling away. It may happen somewhere, but not in the church I pastor by the help and the grace of God. We may be living in the Laodicean age, but, but by the help and the grace of God, there's going to be a church that's alive and well. There's going to be a church that's building something on the foundation. And the glory is going to come back to this house. Say, oh, oh, Brother Dudley, it's already here. Yeah, we got a little little bit of it. We got a little bit of it. There's a whole lot more glory that God wants to bring back to the church. There's a whole lot more glory that God wants to bring back to the church. Amen. You can be seated. Let me preach just a few more minutes. I want to take you back to Hebrews chapter 6. He said, let's go on. And then he talks about those that have tasted those that have tasted, those that have been partakers of the Holy Ghost. He said, if, if, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing that they crucify the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. The reason that some people have so much trouble living for God is because that they feel like that, that, that the, the, the place of origin in their relationship with God is such a sacred place that they can't get very far away from that. All right. And so they take a little journey out here, Brother Hood, a little ways, go a day's journey, and they look back and say, Ooh, I better not go too much further. And so they, they go back to the starting place, and they start all over again. And then the next time, Brother Johnson, they think, Well, maybe I can go two days. So they make it out there, Brother Hudson, a couple of days, and then they say, oh, better not get any further than this. And so they, they come back. Sometimes, sometimes they get so far out, they die before they can get back. But you see, if all you ever do is just come out here to this point and go back here to this point, after a while, you can do that with your eyes closed. Right. After a while, it gets real monotonous. Right. After a while, you've worn yourself a pretty good rut. Right. After a while, you've become bored with church. Right. Bored with your relationship with God. Right. You're tired of it. Right. It's become a burden to you. It's drearisome. Church again, prayer meeting again, worship service again, singing again. You see, that's not what God intended when He gave us the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm going to be in you a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. You know, you, you there are some places you go on a very regular basis and you can go to those places you can almost just put the car on cruise control and it'll take you there by itself because you that car has just become used to making that turn there and that turn there and just put it on autopilot and here we go some folks do that when they come to church they just put it on autopilot and here we go but you know uh, and when you've made that trip so many times, taking that same route, you know wherever sign is, you know wherever dog and cat is, you know wherever chuck hole is. You just you just know the route so well that you've seen you've seen it all. You've just seen it all. And nothing on that route is exciting to you anymore. You can, if you didn't know, you can get in your automobile and 
You can fill it up in Ocala. And you can head north on Interstate 75. And what's about 400 miles away? You can make it to Atlanta. And you can fill it up again in Atlanta. And you can go another 400 miles. And you can fill her up again there. And you can go another 400 miles. And you know what? You're seeing things you've never seen before. And the trip doesn't get tired and monotonous and boring. Because everything's new and exciting. Man, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Eye hath not seen. Ear hath not heard. Neither hath it entered into the heart of man. The things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But He hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. You see, God wants us to start out here but not end up here. He wants us to start out here but not keep coming back to here. He wants us to go on. Let's go on. Let's get out here and let's fill her up again right here. And let's go on a little further. We're going to see something we've never seen before in the Holy Ghost. And we're going to fill her up again right here. We're not just going to keep making that same old journey over and over and over again. We're going to fill her up here. We're going to go a little further. And man, we're going to... I hadn't seen an ear, hadn't heard. And neither hath it entered into the heart of man. Hey, I wonder, I wonder what God does have prepared for those that love Him. What does God have, Brother Pick? What does God have prepared for them that... I hadn't seen it here, hadn't heard it, hadn't entered it into our heart. But, oh, if we can just get in the Spirit. If I can get in the Spirit, Brother McKillop, my eyes going to see something He's got prepared for me. If I can get in the Spirit, my ears going to hear something that He's prepared for me. If I can get in the Spirit, my heart's going to perceive something that He's prepared. You know what? I'm catching a little glimpse of it. Just a little glimpse of that glory cloud. Just a little glimpse of what God wants to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, Elijah. Come on, Elijah. Let's pray. Come on, Elijah. Let's pray. Uh, what are we going to pray for? We're going to pray until, until the hand comes up out of the sea. Uh, we're going to pray until. <laughs> because we hear the sound of abundance of rain. Oh. Amen. Amen. Why don't we learn to come in our journey to this point and and pray until the Holy Ghost renews us right here and realize, hey, I don't have to go back and start all over again. If you just keep going back to point A, you're never going to get past point B. But out here at point B, let's pray through and let's go on to point C. And let's get... Let's get renewed in the Holy Ghost here and let's go on to point D. Hallelujah. And before long, we're going to be seeing <laughs> things we have never seen before. I believe that in Jesus' name. Shall we stand?